conquer local. It's really a breath of fresh air. Good times. I help leaders go from anxiety to authority under pressure. And then let's go and get it. It's an ecosystem. The hardest part here is going to be getting me to shut up on this one. Conquer Local with Vendasta. Hosted by Jeff Tomlin. Welcome to the Conquer Local podcast. Our show features successful sales leaders, marketers, thought leaders, and entrepreneurs who will inspire you with their success stories. Each episode is packed with practical strategies as our guests share their secrets to achieving their dreams. Listen in and learn the highlights of their remarkable accomplishments and get the tips to revamp, rework, and reimagine your business. Whether you're a small business owner, marketer, or aspiring entrepreneur, the Conquer Local Podcast is your ultimate guide to dominating your local market. Tune in now and take your business to the next level. I'm Jeff Tomlin, and on this episode, we're pleased to welcome Frank Saunders. Frank is the co-founder and CEO of SalesForge, an all-in-one sales execution platform. Frank has over a decade of experience in B2B sales, working for companies like Google, SimilarWeb, Black Crow, and Whatagraph, whether as an individual contributor or leading very large sales teams. Currently, he's building SalesForge.ai to give every sales organization the ability to do personalized cold email outreach at scale to 10x their pipeline coverage by connecting unlimited sender accounts and leveraging AI using seller and buyer data to craft unique emails and to do it at scale. Get ready, Conquerors, for Frank Saunders, coming up next on this week's episode of the Conquer Local Podcast. Well, it's a pleasure to welcome Frank Saunders onto the show this week. Frank, how you doing? All, all the way around the world in Lithuania. Welcome to the show. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, and your company? Hey, Jeff. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Um, so, yeah, my name is uh, Frank Saunders. Um, I've been in sales for well over a decade. Um, in my last gig uh, at a company here locally, I led a team of, a team of uh, 50 people. Sales team um, exited the the gig and decided to start my own sales uh, company, sales tech company, uh, specifically focusing on cold email outreach at scale, where we actually uniquely craft every single email to that specific individual, driving humongous lift in reply rate. And uh, so your company's name is SalesForge.ai, and the yeah. cool cool <laughs> name. Um, the, you guys have been doing some. You've had some unconventional approaches to outbound. And so why don't you talk a little bit about some of the unconventional tactics that you've you've employed that have given you an edge over competition in this space? Yeah, I, I think I've been always um, in multiple companies. It doesn't matter whether right now it's Salesforce or many other companies in the past. I've always been like in a red ocean. So that means there's a ton of competition. Um, you have to compete against sometimes other sort of 10, 20 vendors. Um, and ultimately, you need to figure out where your sort of you know potential customers congregate. And in a lot of cases, they will congregate um, in specific communities that are owned essentially by your competitors. Um, it could be you know as simple as a Facebook group. It could be anything where they congregate, but you don't necessarily have like an easy access to that particular community. So you really need to figure out. Um, it could be just a group or a website or a directory, you know, of their clients, really. So you need to figure out, you know, how you identify those groups. And essentially, it has to be a large group so that either you go into that, you either, I don't know, you would scrape that whole list or you would, you know, figure out how do you identify essentially the clients of your competition, right? So, um, and uh, you would build that as a list. Could Sometimes people build that manually. Um, and you would essentially in, in, ingest that into Salesforce. So whatever other CRM that you're currently using. And um, then you would naturally then design specific sort of cold email outreach campaigns or LinkedIn campaigns specifically for that list. Um, so in a lot of cases, you may have a significantly uh, better product than your competition. Your price may be significantly cheaper. There's other angles that you can play. About uh, you know, specific, specifically right now that we're going through a downturn, folks are willing to switch to um, um, other solutions. And uh, we are seeing that in the market as well. It doesn't matter whether it's with sales technology or anything else, but people want to become significantly more cost efficient. They also want to uh, consolidate their tool stack. So that's what we're seeing as well in the space. 
So it's not just on the sales side, but it's also the marketing side. We're seeing the same similar trends. There's a lot of research out there by Salesforce as well on this sort of topic. Um, and that's ultimately what we're looking to capitalize. But the way that you know you can aggressively really compete in the red ocean, you need to be able to figure out who are the clients of your competition and go after them. Um, but in a, in a strategic way, really. Um, from a messaging standpoint, um, from a pricing standpoint, sort of you know contract contractually, how you're going to be buying over those uh, contracts. So yeah, you know, um, uh, outbound is one of the hardest things in sales, and uh, and it's you know it's a challenge for any organization, and even organizations that have uh, you know really effective inbound strategies as they scale. If you want to scale. Um, and become a really large company. There's no getting away from outbound because at some point, no matter how big you are, you have to go out there and start choosing your clients rather than just relying on them finding you. And uh, you know, definitely one of the yeah. things that, that we've realized here. So this is a muscle that you got to flex and you got to become good at. And um, you know, one of the things we've also found is that you know, there's no one single bullet. You have to optimize a lot of different aspects of the, you know the outbound approach in order to get the results that you want. One of those big biggest things is personalization. And sometimes it's challenging to be able to personalize something and get scale because the, the amount of scale that you can reach oh, is you know a big determining factor uh, of your, your ultimate success. And so maybe talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know you guys have found a way to, to personalize messaging and be able to do that at scale. So talk a little bit about how you're able to do that. Yeah. So it's something that I observed, uh, you know, back in my days with the, I was, you know, an account exec or um, as a head of sales. I mean, uh, you always saw the problem of, hey, you know, I can personalize, you know, these particular emails or LinkedIn messages, et cetera, but it does take me a bit more time. Same with videos and stuff like that. Um, so yes, your conversion rate does go up, but then you're missing the volume piece. So really, you know, you still have a hard time to attain your target because you don't have enough activity, essentially, even though you are personalizing. Um, and when folks start to scale, generally speaking, with, let's say, with cold email campaigns, they do, you know, resort to using templates. Um, and templates don't convert because um, users just generally have a sort of fatigue. They can, you know, when they look at an email, you can see it's a template. You can see that it hasn't been personalized to you, to your maybe specific type to your potential pain points, anything that there may be on LinkedIn or a Twitter handle, et cetera, or maybe the website, really. Um, and you can see that. And, and that's the reason why you sort of, you know, reporters gradually sort of, you know, redu uh, go down over time. Um, so the only answer today, especially because Google uh, doesn't like anybody doing cold email outreach. So if you're looking to send essentially more than 50 emails a day, um, it, as part, you know, having a single inbox, a, a, a Gmail, um, then what ends up happening, you end up starting to uh, you landing more and more into spam. That's because you know people start to flag you that this is a spam email. They start to blacklist you, etc. And this happens when you you know when you have a lot of sort of volume there. Um, so we thought to ourselves, you know, how can we you know solve this problem? As in, still provide the ability to to scale cold email outreach, but also ensuring that every single email is personalized. So we we came with the idea with the team that. Um, we will give the ability to connect essentially unlimited number of inboxes into your software. So instead of you know a usual sort of SDR having one single inbox, imagine them having 10 inboxes, 20, 50, 100 inboxes that they would operate out of. And then that means you know you don't you don't have to worry about you know when Google or Microsoft, et cetera, when they penalize you for sending more than 50 emails a day. So that allows you to scale through multitude, you know, multiple inboxes, essentially, and connect that to a single software and then reply across multiple uh, inboxes as well in a single software. Um, and doing that in a way that's efficient for the sales organization. So because most of the software out there right now are charging for every single inbox that's being connected, whereas we don't do that. We charge simply for the consumption, um, meaning the more emails you send, the more we will charge that particular user. Now, the, the second piece is that email copy, right? So um, as, I, as I mentioned, so folks use a lot of templates these days, uh, and we believe they will die over time. Um, so you've already seen with the, with the rise of ChatGPT, uh, and previously, uh, this technology allows you to personalize a scale. Though the problem is, if you did try to do 
a lot of that stuff right now in chat GPT, it does give you a really bad output. Meaning from an email standpoint, you, you wouldn't send anything like that. You wouldn't because it does look like a marketing message. It looks like, you know, it doesn't really look good. And the problem with that is um, is what I would call prompt engineer. You really need to feed a lot of information um, for essentially for large language models to work. So yeah. what does that mean? So in our case, what we do is we do the marrying of um, seller data and the buyer data. So the seller data is essentially that DASTA's example. Um, so we would, as part of app onboarding, ask multiple questions about, hey, you know, listen, uh, Jeff, which industry are you in? What's your ICP? Uh, what are some of the pains that you're tackling? What's the solution? What's the cost of inaction? Who's your competition in this space? And then we would essentially create a profile in the back end about you um, that we then are uh, going to use for every for crafting sort of every single email. So now we're missing then the buyer data, um, and the buyer data comes from publicly available sources. So this is what usually the SDR does. They enter essentially the LinkedIn profile of the person trying to find sort of a hook to personalize and kind of trigger that you know response back. They sometimes may go to Twitter, website, etc. So for now, we're doing LinkedIn. So we're essentially accessing in real time the profile of the person, and we're using all the contents um, that's on their profile. So the about section usually, uh, the headline, what's their title right now, what's in their job description, what is it that they do right now, what is they, because, uh, because a lot of folks do mention uh, some of the pains uh, that they have in their current jobs, what is it that they do, um, some of the targets, so, you know, what historical sort of performance. And uh, we also look at the last post that they've written as well LinkedIn. So we didn't say, hey, listen, AI, pick what you know anything that we have here and then let's marry that with the seller data and let's craft really unique personalized email to that particular person so then imagine a single sdr can send thousands of personalized emails um via email uh for now that's our only channel um and then look we're looking uh in the future to do that also via LinkedIn. so on the one hand you're solving for the deliverability of, of the emails of multiple inboxes. And on the other hand, you're solving for the personalization, you know, with the, with the messaging on that side. And I guess at the end of the day, you get much better results. Exactly. And yeah. That's, that's, I mean, that's very important because, you know, um, I think, um, personalizing is good. It can increase the conversion rate, but you still need to increase the volume. So this is what we knew that it's a, you know, um, it's a big, big issue. So, because, um, you know, some sales organizations either going to go uh, and go with the volume approach. The other ones, usually in enterprise sales, will go with the personalization approach. But there's a lot of companies out there that would love for somebody to essentially bridge the gap between the need for volume and the need to personalize. And that's why, you know, the idea came to, to build Salesforce to enable that. Um, the technology is there. It's just, you know, nobody in space, especially the incumbents, are not looking to do that. Uh, we do believe it will hurt their top line revenue and their margins, which is the reason why they're not looking to drive that drastic productivity increase. Uh, whereas in our case, we're really looking to figure out a way where we go to every, you know, uh, VP sales or every CFO out there and say, hey, listen, whatever the target is that you have in your bag, we'll be able to attain that with the least number of reps. And I think that's a very sexy value proposition out there to folks. It's a no brainer. Especially, you know, if the software is able yeah. to deliver that, um, because you know, if you look at a lot of you know organizations nowadays, they have to become significantly more CAC efficient, um, because it's not anymore you know profit at all costs. It's all, it's back to you know back to product, profitability, yeah. back to profitable growth, um, and that's what we're looking to unlock for a lot of sales orders out there. So that's very cool. Obviously, as a CMO, I'm always looking for different technologies that we can plug into our sales and marketing stack to get an edge and improve our, our conversion mm -hmm. rate optimization and there are, you know, the reach and scale that we have, the powers of revenue growth. Um, oftentimes, you know, the tools that you use those, the, you know, they're only as good as the operator, just like, you know, a race car, uh, you can have uh, the fastest car on the track, but mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it comes down to the driver that's behind the wheel. Uh, more times than not. And so talk a, talk a little bit about your training and coaching strategies because, you know, you, you've indicated that, you know, the, the coaching and training is critically important to the whole process. And there's a lot of different elements that go into that process. So 
talk a little bit about your, your, you know, your approach and those elements that have provided some of the success for, for, for you and your team. Yeah. So uh, naturally, there's plenty of parts, uh, plenty of parts in sales that um, cannot be sort of automated or where you know it's hard to use AI. So one of the jobs I believe will never go away is um, the, the job of an account executive will never go away because, you know, folks do want to talk to a person on the other end um, and being able to deliver really a stellar experience for the for the bias, you need to train your folks um, from the moment potentially, they, you know, when they become an SDR yeah. over to their promotion over to be an AE. But how do you do it in a way that um, you can align the whole sales organization? So I thought to myself, you know, there have to be sort of, it has to be this framework and everybody has their own framework. But in my case, um, I would look at things like performance, right? So in sales, performance is critical, but that, it's not really the only thing. And it carries to everything, you know, so I have four pillars in my mind, and every pillar carries 25% weight. So performance, very straightforward. Are you able to um, attain your quota? What is it that you're doing to try to attain your quota? What's your game plan? Um, pillar number two is really the commitment. So are you committed to really you know, getting better and better over time? Do I see that driving you? Do I see you helping the rest of the org to succeed? So it's very important uh, commitment, right? Because you can see in, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's sales or, you know, um, other other orgs, but people, they, they aren't just driven. They just, you know, don't want to be here. They're not really committed. They just, you know, clock in and clock out essentially. And that's not the type of people really you want around uh, because it impacts, you know, the business. Um, number three is really competence. So, you know, people join um, uh, companies with a set, you know, level of skills and competencies. But what I'm really looking for is like, hey, listen, we're going to have all this training for you, all this coaching and mentoring in the organization. But what is it that you're doing outside of that to become, you know, so much better at your job? You know? um, so do you go and attend sort of, you know, you know, different webinars? Do you speak to other peers in sales? Do you speak to marketing? In your own org and also outside, you know, do you try to, you know, you know, improve your essentially competencies? And the last one is culture. So culture is super important, especially in sales. And you know, there's a say, you know, one bad, bad apple, right? So it can ruin the whole lot. And that's exactly what happens, not just in sales, but I believe also in other teams. And it is important that you know there are you know, a lot of hard days. You get nine no's out of ten. And you need to be able to self-motivate and also motivate the rest of your team because, you know, there's a lot of hard days, right, that you have in your job. But um, you need to embrace, um, you need to be, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to talk about culture. I think a lot of folks pretty much know what I mean. So, um, so those four pillars are super important. So I give, you know, 25% weight to each one of them. Um, and whenever I do sort of performance reviews back in the days, I would just use a sort of simple sort of traffic light system uh, to each one of them. And I would expect every single rep to score sort of yellow or green across the four pillars. And if somebody scores red for a couple of quarters in a row, then we would need to have a sort of more serious conversation, really. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, how I would go about sort of performance management. Sort of in a very simple way that everybody yeah. kind of gets it um and yeah trying to be transparent with everybody naturally so and um yeah you know as as you're walking through those i was thinking of you know a book that i had gone through called the sales acceleration formula by mark roberge who is uh, uh the former cro at hubspot and uh in his book he talks about um you know build you know first and foremost figuring out how you're going to build and scale a sales team and one of the things you have to figure out is what is you know the ideal profile for a salesperson, uh, you know, for your organization. Um, and, but it you know it strikes me that you know there there are sort of some unme immutable attributes of an ideal salesperson for a lot of technology companies, almost regardless of you know what you're selling, whether you're an agency or some sort of te tech firm. You know, immutable attributes like you know the coachability. Uh, regardless, that's important. You know, curiosity, um, uh, empathy. You know, for 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 customers, and so it it strikes me as as you go through, you know, the, your key elements and the, and the pillars that you have that 
you know, sort of aligns with a lot of things that, uh, you know, I, I think that no matter what kind of organization you got to look. Yeah. For. So every, everything that you mentioned um, usually fits under one or the other pillar. So uh, even though I mentioned just four pillars, there's, you know, sort of, you know, subcategories there that we're looking into. So, yeah, being coachable essentially is one of them. Um, and, you know, that's something that we can discuss on a quarterly basis with every single rep and, and, and trying to uh, understand where they are on that particular topic. Um, but yeah, coachability and multiple of other aspects, just like in any other tech company, are really important to um, kind of, you know, uh, kind of improve and, and get ahead, really. So, yeah. Um, one of the things that I do is, uh, you know, I work really closely with our sales um, enablement team and, our, and also our sales operations. And uh, um, as we build out metrics here, when I think about metrics, I think of sort of a, a stair-step model where, you know, the basic metrics you need, you need to know whether, whether you're just winning or losing. Is the light green, the light red, you're winning or losing. And the sort of the next step in analytics is... is um, you know, insights and how to optimize, you know, your approach. And then the next step after that is where you can get predictive analytics um, that help understand, you mm -hmm. know, what's going to happen next. And uh, it's a different level. And now you guys leverage predictive technologies in, in your approach, which can be extremely powerful. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and, and you know, how, how it impacts, you know, success with you guys? Yeah. So, um, so what we touched upon is the generative AI technology or large language models. There's also the old school AI, which is machine learning models and predictive piece of tech. Um, so a lot of kind of predictive uh, kind of modeling, et cetera, came really from advertising from sort of Google, Facebook, when they try and predict um, various ha you know, things happening in, in the auction, et cetera. So I used to work at Google as well um, back in the days. And so we used to apply you know, various um, uh, machine learning models, whether that has to do with advertising, attribution modeling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I also used to work with this company called BlackCrow.ai based in New York, and we used to predict um, what well, they still do, yeah, um, essentially uh, conversion intent all in real time on every single page load by crunching over 400 non-personally identifiable signals about that particular user. And then we used to do a lot of interesting stuff by, you know, feeding um, that information into Google Analytics, Google Ads, Facebook, and then we used to do bidding against the real time, or the real conversion, the real time sort of conversion intent of that particular user, rather than using rules based um, audiences, such as you know whether the user has been on a checkout page or not. Um, and I thought to myself, hey, listen, um, nothing like that really exists in the world of sales. And one of the problems why you know no machine learning exists is because a there's just not enough data that usually companies have. Um, in sales. And the second problem is like, it's not structured, it's not labeled. So you, like machine learning really needs that. Yeah. Um, and the other problem is like, even if companies would go to say a machine learning agency to try and build some predictive models, maybe look for like opportunities and extract X, Y, Z, et cetera, it costs a lot of money. It's usually a seven figure undertaking. Um, and I thought there has to be a better way. So what we're actually doing at Salesforce is behind the scenes, we're actually labeling every single um, company and the ICP, so the ideal customer profile that they're going after. And by being able to label that, what we're doing is we are essentially uh, putting companies into a cluster um, where they exhibit a similar traits. So imagine, I don't know, fintech companies going after e-commerce in the US, that would be a cluster for us. And by clustering companies, your are uh, using a um, approach in machine learning called, called federated learning. And by using federated learning, you're able to train from silo data sets, which allows it, which means you have enough data if you're doing sort of through that approach, but and then you can start predicting stuff. So in our case, what we are really predicting in real time is when should, for example, we should send that email. So we send a lot of emails, but one of the biggest issues is like, when should we send that email? Should be on a Monday. Should be on Friday. What time should we send that email to have the highest open rate, to have the highest reply rate? And for that, you need machine learning to do decision that. Um, when should be the follow up email in this sequence? Should be after four days, five days, six days? And a lot of folks just guessing. They read some reports online from some, you know, look at some averages that you should be sending after five days, but nobody really knows. Um, 
So that's just only one example where you can apply machine learning in a very smart way to drive conversion rate even further by you know, having this sort of cluster approach, uh, training machine learning models based on that cluster, and then feeding back into this whole demo archery software that we have access to with our predictive capabilities. And then in real time, uh, machine learning decides whether you know what time to send that email or which time of the day it is. So yeah. Yeah. Do you have a sense of what type of uplift that you get on conversion rates when you start thinking and using the, this type of approach? Um, because you know, I, I'd say the vast majority of companies are probably probably not using predictive you know technologies and. Uh, you know, in their approach with their e email. So do you, do you have some sort of sense or any, any case study where you had got a benchmark on the, on the uplift on conversion rates? That's a very good question. So uh, generally speaking, we would um, run a large scale A-B test yeah. um, to figure out, hey, you know, what would be the yeah. lift in performance? The dilemma that exists sort of in, 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 um, in outbound or cold email outreach or also on advertising side of things um, is that you need to process a lot of volume generally, and there's a lot of variables that can impact the test. Yeah. Um, but if we just talk about, you know, let's talk about maybe the AI part, right? So if you do personalize emails, um, there we're seeing about a 3x lift in reply rate. So that means, wow. you know, if your reply rate right now is 3%, we were probably looking at 9, 10% reply rate based, um, by using AI, by just, you know, simply personalizing every single email. Wow. Um, on the machine learning side, um, I would say, you know, the, the reply rate by sending at the right time can increase by sort of 10, 15 percent. Uh, that's what we're seeing on our end. Now, there's other kind of activities that we will be predicting in the future, you know, when to do something at which particular time of the day or day of the week, like, you know, on, on LinkedIn, front, for example, or maybe other channels like Twitter, etc. And it becomes very complex very quickly. Um, but the sort of the answer is, you know, we, we do expect to see at least 10% improvement in sort of reply rate, which is conversion rate for us. But really what we're optimizing as a business is towards having as many meetings attended as possible. So um, so that's really our sort of macro conversion in our head, uh, how we're optimizing sort of the whole system. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot more that will go into that in the future. That's huge. Uh, and, you know, in order to get that type of uplift, and I, I remember giving a, a talk a little while ago, this is probably a few years ago, we did some math on um, taking a look at an entire um, inbound, it was at that time, it was an inbound, not an outbound funnel, um, but optimizing mm -hmm. a multiple steps in the entire funnel. And if you can increase the, you, you know, the effectiveness of one part of the funnel, it has a compounding effect all the way through the funnel. And so if you can get a 10% uh, uh, you know, increase yeah. here, and a 25% increase there, it's actually not that far. You can tweak a few knobs. You can get a 10X improvement at the end of the day just by improving yeah. a few things a little bit. So, I mean, that, that's, that's really cool uh, and, and, and pretty awesome. Yeah, I mean, I do also have a, you know, quite a bit of experience on, on running inbound as well for, for companies. And I generally say, you know, on inbound, three things really matter. So one is the process. Um, sec um, the second one is the number of leads or MPLs, or SPLs that, that you know are coming by inbound. And the third one that people don't usually look at is the speed. Yeah. Um, you probably have signed up, you know, to various demos out there in the US, right? And uh, and sometimes people reach out to you after week only. Yeah. Right. So um, to give an idea, of what I've done for one company uh, here in Europe is we implemented um, SLAs. So yeah. where we had to call that particular lead within 15 minutes. So Twilio does, for example, in the US, um, which is the number one web platform in the world, um, they call their prospects within two minutes from them signing up. And that speed is crucial. And the reason why it's crucial is because, especially as you operate in a red ocean market, imagine you're signing up, um, you get a, you know, sign up for a demo yeah. or just start a trial, because there's also a lot of other options uh, you know, out there, uh, whether you know, the person just looks for alternatives right now on Google, et cetera, uh, they may go with your competitor. But because you were potentially very quick to get them on the call, et cetera, you push them through the funnel. You push them through the funnel so deep that it just decided to go ahead with you because they really you know, appreciate the service uh, as a you know, quick call, quick demo booking, um, and they were able to sign the contract super quick. And that experience, you know, 
that swift, you know, fast experience is something that I really appreciate. Um, and it's not something that, you know, a lot of still yeah. tech companies are able to deliver these days. I, I can vouch for that insight because internally here, mm -hmm. we found that uh, one of the one of the biggest uh, uh, factors that improved our overall conversion rates was time to lead. So I, I can I, I can exactly uh, relate to what you're saying. What um, I was going to ask yeah. you, um, email fatigue. So how, what, what is what can you do to combat mm -hmm. email fatigue? Is it you, you know it, it, do you guys see that as an issue still? Yeah, so it's, it a bit relates, I guess, to what I mentioned um, about sort of sending templates, right? So most companies out there, or majority of emails, like ninety plus percent. Um, in cold email outreach are templates these days. Um, everybody uses them. Um, people are generally speaking looking for templates on the web, then they're applying as part of the sequences and then off they go. Um, but when I receive a lot of emails and I receive, I don't know, 100 emails a day, I guess, um, I, I, you, you can see that like 99% of them are all templated. It's not, there's very barely any information about me, my potential pains, um, nobody has looked at my LinkedIn profile, nothing like that. It's a, it's a very simple template with a, um, maybe with a bit of a rules-based personalization as in, you know, they, they see I work at Salesforce and that's about it. But that doesn't fly these days. And, you know, users just have a, just like with Zoom, they have a fatigue uh, looking at these templates. And hence why, you know, the fly rate is really so low. So, you know, the bar is really low in cold email outreach these days. Um, so I do believe that actually one of the most efficient ways that tech companies can scale these days is through cold email outreach. Because uh, in LinkedIn, it's very tricky because, you know, Google, uh, LinkedIn caps you. In, in advertising, you know, you participate in an auction. There's a lot of software out there trying to fight for the attention for the users. So it becomes very expensive very quickly. But um, by, you know, sending personalized emails at scale, that's still, you know, one of the most efficient ways that I'm, you know, from my perspective, when well, I'm scaling up also Salesforce right now, for me, you know, uh, dog food in our own software, it's, it's going to be the most profitable way for us to acquire clients. Um, so, yeah, and, and, you know, we all know that there is this fatigue with those, you know, looking at those templates. So the answer is personalizing these emails, either with text, naturally, the other approach is naturally uh, sending videos. So you can get Loom or Vidjar and then you know, send the video on top of the LinkedIn profile. But that's not very scalable as well because it takes you, you know, a fair bit of amount of time. And it's okay if you're in enterprise sales. Right. But what if you're you know, a high velocity sales org? What if your you know, deal sizes are like tiny? Like you aren't able to really to do that. So what we're already seeing in the space is actually where companies like, there's a company in San Francisco called Tavis. Um, and they already start doing what I call deep fakes essentially. You record your face, you record your voice once, and then you're actually able to personalize videos at scale already. So, you know, you already won't be able to distinguish whether that was a real video or whether that was done by AI. And that's essentially where we are. And that's essentially how the world will morph from these static videos, unpersonalized videos maybe, or um, these templates that are being used over to, you know, more of the AI stuff. Um, and, I do believe that companies will become significantly more efficient um, and the population will get used to it eventually. Uh, it will take a few years for sure. Um, but yeah, I always get this sort of um, question from either that's the investors or, uh, or the users and they say, hey, listen, maybe one day AI will be talking to AI. I was like, probably that will be the case. You'll be using AI to prospect uh, and then your prospects will respond with AI back to you. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, AI will do business with AI. Potentially, that will be the future in about 10 years. Uh, not now, though. Yeah. I could talk uh, about this f for a very long time with you. Always trying to optimize our approach here and figure out how, you know, we reach our target audience in more efficient ways. Uh, you covered a lot of ground. So... Any what what are the what are the top two takeaways that you want to leave the audience with? Um, I guess the number one capitalize on AI. So if you're not going to capitalize on AI, your competitors as well for sure. So um, embrace it's important to embrace AI as an organization and then see where you can drive efficiency. Some people want to delay that topic, but I assure you, your competitors are probably going after it. 
uh, and trying to figure out ways of how to make, you know, whether that's a sales work or marketing significantly more efficient. And the more you delay, the more you're gonna, you're gonna fall behind. So definitely capitalize on that. Um, and the other thing is, I think, think about your email deliverability. So I still see that most companies, big and small, don't think about this huge problem that exists and nobody talks about it a lot, is that a lot of your emails just land in spam. And it's not just on outbound, but it's actually also on inbound as well. And the quick big question is like, what do you do about it? Are you doing anything at all? So the whole huge topic about email deliverability, because a lot of your transactional emails could be landing in spam. A lot of your support emails could be landing in spam. Um, and really what I would, you know, my big advice is kind of review email deliverability across your whole org. Because I see that a humongous problem, not just, you know, with cold email, but also, you know, when I sign up to some newsletters or when I sign up actually as a user on a particular site. Even once I sign up for a demo and the invite went to the spam, even though it was, I got invited by Google. So it was, you know, to, uh, the URL from Google. So even that, so landing the spam is, is, is it's a huge problem these days. Um, so I would urge companies to investigate as in whether they're doing a good job on that front and just simply ask the clients or the prospects whether the emails land in the spam and you'll be able to realize that very quickly if you, whether you have an issue or not. So yeah, I think these will be my two key takeaways. Well, I think that those takeaways are very notable. I'll vouch for you on that. And lastly, before we break, um, Frank, if people want to find out more information, they want to continue the conversation with you, how do they reach out to you? I think just like anybody else out there, you'll reach out on LinkedIn, Frank Saunders, Salesforce.ai, very quickly to find us. Um, if you want to check out the platform, um, just go to Salesforce.ai, sign up, and off you go. Um, otherwise, you, you can see me at different conferences, in particular in Europe, whether that's Saster. Um, I do fly over to the US time to time as well, so you can catch me there. Um, but yeah, LinkedIn is the usual, I think. I will say thank you, sir, for joining us on this episode of the Conquer Local Podcast. It was a pleasure having you on, and uh, I look forward to having you back on in the not-too-distant future, talk about how things are going at, uh, at uh, your company and the changes that you're seeing, uh, because what we, do, what we see here is that things are changing really quickly, and uh, you have to align yourself with companies that are reacting to that change, and it cer certainly sounds like you're doing that. Pleasure having you on, and I uh, wish you a very happy and, uh, and healthy summer. Thanks, Jeff. You too. You know, Frank shared some valuable insights. Two key takeaways from his discussion include the importance of capitalizing on AI and personalization in sales, as well as prioritizing email deliverability and addressing email fatigue. You know, Frank emphasizes the need to leverage AI and personalization to gain a competitive advantage. And by strategically identifying and targeting competitors' clients, businesses can effectively compete in the market. Personalizing emails through customer profiling and real-time insights can significantly enhance conversion rates and engagement. Addressing email deliverability and combating email fatigue are also crucial. It's important to review and optimize deliverability to ensure that messages reach the prospect's inboxes and utilizing tools like videos and personalized recordings, companies can increase the effectiveness of cold emails and mitigate email fatigue associated with generic templates. By embracing these three things, AI technology, personalization, and deliverability, businesses can improve their sales performance and stand out in a very crowded marketplace. If you've enjoyed Frank's episode discussing how to craft successful cold emails, keep the conversation going and revisit some of our older episodes from the archives. Check out episode 534, Old School Closing Strategies with Benjamin Bressington, or episode 237, Cold Calling from our Master Sales Training Series. Until next time, I'm Jeff Tomlin. Get out there and be awesome. You've been listening to the Conquer Local Podcast presented by Vendasta. Tune in next week for a new episode. Guest discovery and produced by Suleiman Adam. Marketing by Rory Lawford, Nicole Lozon, and Suleiman Adam. Executive producers, Brendan King, Jeff Tomlin, and Suleiman Adam. Recorded at Bindasta headquarters on the Canadian prairies.